Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's so wonderful to have you here for another GBSN cross-border webinar. Today, we are joined by one of our new members, the Universal Business School. Um, they will be ex uh, discussing experiential learning for skills development. As always, we encourage you to use the chat during this session, ask your questions, comment, introduce yourselves. We love the community here at GBSN and these webinars are just another opportunity for you all to connect with and learn from each other. As always, this webinar is being recorded. We will share a recording of the webinar uh, afterwards and it will always be live on the GBSN website should you want to explore this recording or previous cross-border webinar recordings. So we look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say, Tarun, take it away. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to just take a second to share my screen. Um, is it clear? You can see it? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a ton um, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Again, good afternoon, evening, and good morning to you, all of you from all parts of the world. It's a great privilege to have this platform to share some of the things we've been doing uh, at Universal Business School. Uh, before I get into the meat of the discussion, I'd like to share a little bit of context uh, from where we got to. Uh, so Universal Business School was uh, established in 2009 by industry um, leaders who had you know, worked for global multinationals at CEO, CXO levels. Um, so these were, you know, whether it was Novartis, Standard Chartered, uh, Thomson Reuters, um, Royal Dutch Shell, so these were CEOs who had worked for these multi-billion dollar corporations and headed them and decided there's a vacuum uh, in India's business capital, Mumbai, to set up a, uh, you know, international business school, uh, which, can, which can provide global education. Uh, and we founded that school on three parameters, which was we call the 3E framework, ethical practices uh, to create a sustainable, uh, long-term thriving business, uh, environment, so we are very big on environment. We are India's first green business school. And the third was experiential learning. So that was the context. And what we said was, you know, the world is changing dramatically, right? Uh, even in 2009, we had just come out of the financial crisis. Um, you know, everything was changing uh, at, a, at a fast pace. And so we said, let's change everything. Let's question uh, the current mo mode of teaching, learning, and let's come up with a new way of dealing. Right. So it's been uncertain days for CEOs back then. It is not, it's as true as it's possible even now. Uh, so I'll give you my personal story. I was in Wall Street, uh, you know, having worked in London, New York, Hong Kong, and we had created a, a joint venture uh, between uh, Thomson Reuters and Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, to create the world's first FX exchange. Uh, things were go going amazingly well. You know, we had all the prime brokers, all the big banks on our platform. We had all the hedge funds and uh, trading on our platform. And we were doing $5 billion of trading every day. Suddenly, the financial crisis happened. It started, started moving in February, where a couple of uh, hedge funds went under. And then the prime broker, Bear Stearns, went under. And then it just kept, went, kept going down, down, downhill till September 15th. We had Lehman Brothers fail. Uh, and with that, AIG was bailed out, uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, uh, all of them were, you know, on, on, I would say, oxygen life support, uh, and the U.S. government, U.S. Fed had to bail them out. So the world changed dramatically. Here we had a thriving organization spread all in all three, you know, time zones. And then we had pulled the plug. We said, we need to fire everybody. So I, my, I, at that point, I was based in Hong Kong. We had to fire everybody. Uh, and the world, you know, uh, we had to seize uh, this entire model completely, right? So the world is, is no different. Uh, it's moving at a fast pace, whether you talk about the Brexit uh, or the recent U.S. elections, how the policy frameworks change, uh, U.S.-China relations, U.S.-Russia relations. These are all playing through uh, in every CEO's mind. How do I, um, you know, react to these uh, then you have the additional sanctions sometimes or, you know, impacting the prices of oil. You have issues like uh, gender equality, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, work from home now in the COVID world. Of course, the pandemic has changed everything. Um, 
So this is the, the context, right? Whether it's uh, the technology driving the world at a very fast pace, uh, trade wars, all of this is a entire cauldron. How do we make the manager of tomorrow to be able to deal with this, right? How does he deal with these scenarios and how does he become uh, agile, adept, resilience to be able to make sensible, uh, sustainable, long-term decisions? So this was the backdrop, right? When we were thinking of our program design. And we said, you know what? Uh, we've got to look at an unconventional approach. We have to rethink, re-strategize and completely refocus our business model uh, and ensure that the managers of tomorrow are someone who is, are definitely adaptive to the changes and they're going at a very, very fast pace. So completely be agile and reshape the, the way they think about business, right? So that was the context. And what we saw in India and several other schools, we looked at uh, business schools around the world. And case study was a very predominant method of learning. And we said, that's a static model, which is at a particular point of time, it's a very effective tool for learning, but in a fast moving, uh, uh, insanely unpredictable world, can we create more ways of learning, right? So that's what was the backdrop of the entire uh, theme behind Universal Business School. And we said, okay, uh, we got to completely disrupt uh, the models of case study. So we said, let's put case study at the bottom. 60 CEOs came together uh, from all over the world, from 15 countries. And we said, can we as CEOs, and you know, I had a corporate job, um, ran a $2 billion business in more than 100 countries. Um, so, and I worked in all five continents. So, you know, we all put our heads together and said, can we innovate to create a model where students are completely, you know, learning what they're going to be eventually facing in, in the uh, real world, right? And that's that was the whole thing of, it came to us loud and clear way back in 2009, experiential learning is the only way forward, right? And more so because to understand this, you need to understand the students, right? Uh, students uh, of today are, you know, we are talking of adult learning. We're not talking of pedagogy for the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, instructive learning for people uh, below K-12. Uh, these are students who are motivated, self-directed, so they want to have interactive classrooms. You can't be, you know, sage on stage any longer. You need to bring, uh, you know, the, they want to bring their professional experiences into the classroom and, of course, their personal interests. Uh, so you need to make sure that you capture that and have a reflective learning uh, and creative uh, way of thinking, which they can imbibe in this manner. Uh, they are all goal oriented, no longer are grades that important. So uh, they want to look at the relevance, solve real world problems in the classroom. Uh, they want to, you know, um, experience failure, experiment, learn from that experience. And finally, we need to treat our students as equals, right? They should be open to expression of ideas, reasoning, they want feedback. And that feedback loop needs to come to us. So we need to readjust, right? So uh, it was very clear that not only the corporate world will want this, but our students, uh, the most important uh, for us were of the same format thinking, right? So we came up with the experiential learning waterfall. Uh, and we said, uh, we will look at various ways. So case study is gonna be the base, the bedrock of the way we do teaching. We wanna move upstream and see how can we create and curate experiences for our students which would be uh, very action, immersive learning and experiential oriented. So I'm gonna give you a few examples here and we'll deep dive into four or five to give you an idea of how we actually put it in practice, right? So um, just to give you an idea, we said we'll create a global cross asset trading room on our campus. Uh, you know, live prices from 100 exchanges all over the world, whether it's the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ or London Stock Exchange or Tokyo, uh, the Nikkei, or, or you know, Singapore Stock Exchange, DAX in Germany, the PAC in France. Let's get all exchanges, commodity, currency, bond markets, uh, and, and uh, of course, equity markets. Each student will give, be given $10 million notional capital. He or she has to invest it into you know, these diverse asset classes. Now, why is that important, right? The importance we felt was that, you know, when Shinzo Abe, the prime minister of Japan raises interest rates, the former prime minister, uh, you will see an activity happening on the Japanese yen. So you can take a call on that. Or when the former uh, president of the United States, Donald Trump says, 
I'm going to build a wall uh, between Mexico and United States. Uh, everybody says, yeah, that's a crazy idea. I agree. But uh, the students have to factor that, that piece of information and say, okay, how can we use this piece of information? So you want to build a billion dollar wall, you need steel, cement, which are the exporting countries, uh, UK, Europe, let's go and go long in some of these, uh, you know, stocks, right? Um, or if you want to look at, you know, how the Googles and Amazons are competing with the um, likes of Alibaba or Baidu in China, I know Alibaba is going through a little tough uh, space right now. So then we want to make a, a play, a tech play uh, comparing these giants, right? Or look at commodity markets in Australia or actually hammer the Indian rupee against the US dollar if the Indian government is not managing its current account deficit. So the world is completely connected. And we said our students should be able to trade these asset classes in real time with notional capital uh, and see the world moving. I mean, you know, it's like similar to what a trader in Citibank New York or Deutsche Bank Frankfurt would do, right? So let's give them that experience. And they're monitoring markets on 24 seven. These days, all the apps are available and they see their portfolios moving. They make change, they course correct, they make losses, they make profits, they understand why is things happening the way they are. So that was one program we started. Then we said, how do we get more experiential? Okay, this might be interesting to the finance guys. What about the others, right? So we created a company on campus where students can join and over time, they can actually uh, uh, grow in this company. They make new products, develop new services, create new ideas, bring them to the market, test them in the market, fail some products, fail some products, don't make it, they make profits, they make losses. They organize themselves like a corporation, they file the balance sheets, pay all the uh, you know, taxes to the governments, um, and, and therefore they make you know, strategic choices. And that's exactly what managers in the real world do, right? So they are making, and this is real money, right? And then they, get a, they, they do a valuation of the company, they get uh, stock options, and they can even get dividends, right? So this is what happens in the real world. So we curated it, and you join the company the day you join the MP. Right. So similar to this, we had several such programs. I'm going to go deeper into consulting uh, uh, in, and research publication uh, to give you an idea of what we did. Uh, then we obviously have in, in the, uh, internships like everybody else in across the world, uh, you know, industry life projects where we were working. So our students were working with the Dutch university to understand how Dutch companies were performing at 30, 40 percent growth rates in India. Whereas they, the, you know, they were um, anemic growth rates in Holland. So those kinds of collaborations really bring this, this world of experiential learning to, uh, to, to the fray. Then we said, let's do a global project management workshop in UK, where our students were exposed to two giants in the mobility sector, uh, you know, Boeing. So they went to the uh, factory floor of Boeing, and then they went to the factory floor of uh, Jaguar, Land Rover, and they saw two mega corporations in mobility space were completely different. Uh, Jaguar had all people, uh, you know, doing all the mechanics, and Boeing was completely done by robotics. So that brings that aha moment. Oh my God, this is how, and then you understand why a particular firm follows a particular practice, right? I'm going to go deeper into the smart project uh, a little later. Then from a gamification, we do a lot of games in the campus uh, where, you know, we did the sandwich game where, uh, you know, students have to, are given certain resources and they have to create an end product. And what are the bottlenecks that they face in manufacturing, in logistics, in supply chains, and, and you know, manage through learning that process, right? So that, that's the real uh, learning factor. Then we said, let's do tech, uh, techniques of shadowing. So we took a model from the UK government, right? The UK government has a shadow cabinet. So we said, how can we use that uh, and get our students to shadow up with industry and learn and face the challenges, have those one-off one interactions, get some data, look at third-party data, and then try and say, help the guy, uh, give, give his own view on that particular sector or that particular product line or that particular marketplace that they're targeting, right? Uh, and then we went further, the top students get an industry mentor who spends two hours a day, uh, uh, sorry, a month with them, 
so that they go deep into understanding what are the challenges that industry faces, right? So, and then there was the case blazer, which I'm going to go into a lot more depth. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of the uh, contour of how we created this experiential learning waterfall. And we literally believed in the fact that, you know, the world is connected, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, we are big pro proponents of the butterfly effect. The flapping of the wings of a butterfly in the Atlantic Ocean can cause a storm in the Pacific Ocean. And that's what we're going through, friends. A, a bat in Wuhan has given the entire world a pandemic, right? So that's the way the world, everything is connected, right? So that's how you need to uh, apply these concepts in the world of management. So when we built that uh, first step was to build the experiential learning waterfall. And then we said, we're going to layer it with certain unique things which come with where our ethos is. So for example, we are very big focus on green thinking. So we layered it that we should have green finance, green marketing, green operations, green logistics, supply chain to be taught as a subject. And then at the end of it, the project they need to do is, uh, you know, uh, related to one of the United Nations uh, Sustainable de Development Goals, right? So that was a uh, hook into that. Then we said we need to go at a meta level with the student and literally understand him, allow him to create a toolkit for himself, a personal development toolkit. So it's it's completely hands-on. You go, go uh, through a process of discovery and actually feedback. Uh, and reflect. And then on that basis, you create your own individual customized toolkit, uh, which will help you deal with the vulnerabilities that you have particular to yourself. Uh, this was one. And then we were also big on uh, health and sports uh, being a critical component. In fact, uh, uh, some would find this interesting. We insist that you've got to place a, a, a sport uh, actively. And if you don't, you actually lose credit points. Now, I, I don't know how that would uh, tee up from a business school perspective, but we believe that that's doing a great job and some of the skill sets I'll talk about that we get through this. So this was the layer we created uh, around the entire, um, what are the activities we're going to do? Now, once you have the activities, you need to go to the next step, which is devising what are the skill sets the students are going to acquire by these activities, right? So uh, uh, it's all evident, you know, the summer internship, it's all about them going into the corporate world uh, for a couple of months, two to three months, you know, get professional, you know, solve problems on the day and of course manage their time well. We have a design thinking workshop. It's all about creativity, uh, you know, entrepreneurial thinking and of course problem solving. Uh, the sports part of it, which we call sports well-being, it's to be a sports person. Don't get upset when you lose a match, right? Uh, we, we, you can't throw the uh, spanner in. You've got to be there uh, to get back, figure out what you need to do to you know, uh, get better at whatever the sport you are. And that's what management is all. You lose a deal, that's okay. It's not the end of the world, right? So ability to handle pressure and, of course, work with your teams is going to be a critical component uh, of uh, skills that... Uh, future managers would require. Uh, we have an OB lab where we look at you know, enhancing the productivity of each skill and measuring the uh, productivity and uh, helping them get to their goals, right? Where do they want to be in X period of time? The toolkit, uh, which I shared with you, it's all about you know, embracing change. This is how it allows them to um, be flexible. Uh, so the trading room is one such toolkit. The case blazer is another. And of course, uh, develop your analytical skills. Then coming to industry men mentorship, we've uh, spoken to our industry mentors to say, you know, why don't you make sure that you focus on certain areas, which is getting students to be self-accountable, aware of that particular industry, and, you know, get, get cracking on deadlines, right? Because that's one of the things which we have saw, uh, you know, as a nation, uh, we are, uh, you know, tend to be last minute, and that's not, not a good thing as a professional. Uh, we have our own internal mentors where we groom our students, get them on business etiquette, uh, you know, networking skills, which will help them in the future. Uh, and then we get deeper into the next layer, which is competency building, uh, which is all about all these various things which get them agility, adaptability, uh, dealing with conflicts and multiple scenarios, right? Today, as you know it, uh, you know, there was a time I used to meet CEOs and they say we make a budget for a year or three years. Now they're making a budget every quarter and still they have to adjust it because it's such an uncertain period. 
then uh, wisdom towards self-excellence gets down to their EQ levels, emotionally, how they can manage situations, and potentially HQ as well, right? Heart portion. What are they do doing to, their, uh, to uh, support uh, the community at large? And finally, create a, a reflective report which will help in self-improving uh, improving themselves. Uh, our smart CR, CSR project, uh, which, which I'll go into much le uh, detail, it's all about you know, getting them empathy, uh, understanding what's around you, how you can deal with it, and involve yourself and contribute to community. And it, it, it makes them feel, uh, you know, uh, you will hear some of them speak uh, in a bit, uh, very, very good about themselves, right, that they have actually contributed. Uh, our leadership development, every student has to go into uh, what I call institutional building, right? So they take a piece of the administration of the school, uh, lead it, work in teams, uh, and their customers are the other students and collaborate, right? So that's very, very important. Uh, the research project, uh, which uh, I, you know, they write a research publication. It's all about critical thinking, problem solving, analytical uh, thinking, which is similar to the um, consulting project. And uh, management of self is throughout two years, uh, they go through this program where they are continuously developing themselves. How do we negotiate better salaries? How do we develop professional skills? How do we become better communicators? Because the future is going to be uh, skills plus communication. Communication is going to be a very, very important factor. So we laid down these uh, experiential learning goals uh, or events or activities and what would be the skills. Now I'm going to go to the next layer of depth because that's at a, you know, still at a I would say 50%. We need to, to, to get it down into actual practice. How do we get it done? So my the first thing I'm going to deep dive is our consulting aptitude project, right? This was where uh, three or four students had to get together, uh, go for a month. They had to solve a business problem, right? They needed to, firstly, we did a guided immersion. So they would have you know, lectures from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Yes, my professor loves night lectures. Uh, and then develop giving them all the toolkits that it would and frameworks that they would need to uh, solve industry problems. Uh, they had to find the client themselves. There was no spoon feeding. And we said, you know what? Doesn't matter the token amount you get, but you need to make sure that you are actually acquiring the client and you can sell them the benefit of the consulting that you're going to be doing. Right. Uh, and then the learning outcomes were, of course, you know, demonstrate your knowledge, your skills, uh, solve those problems in an analytical, systematic decision making approach and demonstrate it you know, through effective communication. So you're really solving life problems in the industry uh, in a professional standpoint, right? which is what uh, industry would want uh, you to do. Uh, there's a bunch of skills we'll go into detail uh, about in the next slide. Uh, and then we said, how do we create a rubrics around this? This also, I'll get deeper into the next slide. And the final overall impact, and this is what we really, really feel good about, right? Uh, because of this continuous going through this consulting assignments, uh, each student, you know, solving it, and they were targeting small and medium enterprises. They weren't targeting the big, big, big uh, multinational corporations, right? Uh, these are the people who can't afford the big four, right? They can't go to the KPMGs of the world, the Deloitte's of the world. So can you actually create at a very uh, you know, nominal value, uh, nominal amount, uh, some value for these corporations? And they were delighted because nobody would ever approach them. Uh, and the whole objective was learning, right? So this has resulted in our students getting you know, amazing opportunities with um, Deloitte uh, and you know, Accenture, uh, Ernst & Young and KPMG. Uh, so we felt great that this is actually paying off into their uh, their careers, right? The bigger impact was that 46 organizations, small, medium organizations were transformed by our students, right? By doing a project on the ground. And to add to that, we got a couple of international assignments uh, as well, right? So we were not only uh, doing that, but we got two international assignments, which I'll probably uh, share with you. So... Once they do the project, how do we get, what are the rubrics we use as a school to actually you know, bring it back into the academic calendar? We've got program outcomes to, uh, to reach, module outcomes, uh, course outcomes. So we said we will design it in a way that we can you know, challenge them at the same time, make sure that they're doing a good job, right? So from problem definition, 
to research work, to analysis and application of these tools and concepts that they're learning within school. So they do this in year two, right? They learn in year one, they go into the CAP project in year two. Uh, they, they create the solution that the innovation that they're bringing to the table and the presentation and the written communication, the style, the structure, uh, what are they doing about it? So this is how you get, you know, we, we actually uh, rate the students and assess them. And then these are the skills uh, uh, which they acquire, which we talked about, strategic thinking, research skills, analytical skills, um, you know, commercial awareness, because they're actually solving a real life business problem for a small medium enterprise. And of course, as a team, how they're gonna get that done. These are just to give you a sense of the kind of industries that we were able to cover from FMCG, education, logistics, hardware, hospitality, agro, apparels, healthcare. Uh, so it was a broad brush uh, and, and which, which I'm very pleased with. We got a couple of international projects, as I said, which I was uh, delighted. You know, we got a project in China uh, in industrial products, right? Where we did uh, a whole survey and we got the students actually made all the money themselves, a large chunk. Uh, we got another a big project and for st students to get this was, you know, honey on the, on the toes. Uh, we got another project with a American uh, firm who was trying to get um, some consulting in education. Uh, and that was another uh, wow project. So uh, what has been the overall impact of this CAP project over the years, every year, more than 40, 45 uh, companies, we actually go out and consult with them. This year, we were lucky uh, to get two international clients in a COVID world, which is uh, quite, uh, that was like the cherry on the top. Uh, across sectors, great opportunities for them uh, in career work. They expand their professional networks because they're talking. And obviously, as you all know, you won't land the first project that you go for. You probably have to get few rejections before you actually land the project. Uh, they were actually uh, reaching out to the community uh, at large, small, medium enterprises surrounding our uh, school. And, uh, you know, the most important thing was the value to the clients, right? The clients actually believe and they're coming back saying, you know what, this was great. At the price point, it was too attractive and we have you to come back again. So this really brought it all together. Now, project number two, or, or experiential learning, where we're going to do a deep dive, is the leadership development program. Again, here, as I said, it's about institutional building. Uh, the students uh, focus on project management because they're bringing live events uh, to to the community, to to the community of students, and to the larger community of students across the the city, and and so on. So they do mega projects. They get sponsorships. They actually. Uh, have pro, uh, you know um, events which are uh, they invite corporates for these events and they make some great money they make profit on it which is great uh, they learn they make losses as well right so that's the important aspect so uh, again skills development uh, I will you know it's it's clear leadership teamwork conflict resolution because they're working you know sometimes there are 50 students 100 students involved in an organization so there's obviously going to be competing challenging environments. So the, how do they resolve conflicts? How do they build uh, credibility with their colleagues, uh, skills, uh, you know, interpersonal skills. And they're all, a lot of their products are going into the marketplace. So they are dealing with ambiguity on a, you know, regular basis. So that's, um, you know, in terms of the skills develop, I'm going to go deeper into the rubrics. Uh, but the most important thing from an impact perspective is uh, every year we create 24 CXOs. And what's amazing to see is that these CXOs grade in, go into the industry and do magic, right? So that's what uh, the objective is, that they make their impact in the, in the real world, uh, in the industry. Uh, and also the important part is that they are developing the institution and, and that's, that's great. They feel a sense of belonging as well. Now, this is our flagship pro project, Case Blazer, 48 hours. Uh, this is what you know, even today, 10 years ago, students who've graduated from Universal Business School, they come back and say, this was the best moment. Why was that? Because they spent 48 hours together in an intense environment where they solved 12 cases, like a case relay. Uh, 48 hours nonstop, without sleeping, with very little rest, 
they have to solve 12 cases. And each of these cases are 35, 40 pages, right? So they, they get together as a team of two uh, and they are collaborating with each other. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a pressure, right? It's pressure, 48 hours without sleeping to get through to the next day uh, and keep going. I mean, you know, most of you, uh, if you know Wall Street, there were many times I never saw my house for 48 hours, right? So we said, can we stretch them and get them to feel the same kind of uh, way? Uh, the key learning outcomes for the case blazer, of course, is to demonstrate their knowledge, skills, solve the organization problems of the case, uh, you know, using the right method, uh, apply all the frameworks they've learned, and ability to interpret the data and uh, recommend strategic actions. The skills, we will go in detail. The rubrics, again, I, I would like to go in deep detail in the next slide. So uh, back to the point, right? We wanted to get our students to be analytical, handle pressure, and you know they come out uh, a different person after those 48 hours. So that's great. And that the students who were always uh, taking part in this uh, toolkit were always the guys who were in the distinction and merit list. There was no question about that, right? So we said we will have the evaluation on two parameters. One is the actual activity where 70% weightage would be given to that. And the second one was the reflective report, right? Where they actually reflect on their experience and that would be given a 30% weightage. The, uh, the rubrics we followed for evaluating our students, of course, was the case synopsis, the problem definition, analysis and inferences that they had, creative, innovative recommendations that they made and the presentation style and creative uh, creativity they showed. So uh, it was equal. The skills they developed were time management, big time. Uh, analytical skills, of course, case, cases would mean uh, critical thinking, analytical thinking, problem solving. And of course, because they were working in a team, the team dynamics played into, and there was all, obviously, uh, they, they, they couldn't, they had to, you know, each student had to give the other one you read this part, I'm going to do this while you're, you're crunching that, I'm going to, so a trust a framework had to be built. Uh, and those who could, uh, who won, did a great job at that. On the leadership development program, uh, we applied a different set of metrics. Uh, so here the rubrics were project management, active participation, you know, innovation that they're bringing, you know, the products they were bringing to the table, the events they were bringing to the table. Uh, how they collaborated with the other clubs, right? It's very, very important. Uh, we feel that, yeah, they will compete with each other, but they need to collaborate uh, so that this event is a successful event for the entire company. And of course, to follow uh, the code of conduct, right? While they're doing this. Uh, and of course, on the back of that, skills that we evaluated that they had developed was leadership, conflict resolution, collaboration, interpersonal skills, and of course, handling ambiguity. So this was all on the back of a um, you know program where we said you need to do self assessment on on one side the club mentor so if, uh, you know we have a patron for the club who's uh, uh, part of Universal Business School uh, looking at the achievements that the individual has achieved the team has achieved and then the self awareness of what have you contributed and on this side it was all about the transferable uh, professional skills that they have acquired during this program. And of course, their own, um, you know, strengths, which they feel came out in, in lieu of that. So we feel that these kinds of programs actually created the base for them to become lifelong learners because they had now started enjoying the concept of learning, right? We had to make it fun. We had to make it challenging. We had to push the students. Uh, and that's what really brings out the best in them. And, and we've had uh, some amazing experience on that front, right? Um, now, this is the fourth one I'm going to deep dive, research. So this, all these, remember, are credit courses. So even here, three or four students can get together and they have to actually publish uh, a research paper, right? Uh, I'm not going to talk about research in too much depth because you guys uh, in the GBS and fraternity are far, far superior in terms of research. But this was our small attempt to say, you know, we will put it in the curriculum. We will insist that every student in some shape or form is contributing to the publishing of a research paper. 
right? Uh, and of course, the skills are evident, uh, which would come, uh, and uh, the measuring also is clear. Um, how you know we would look at the formats, the referencing models, whether it was pr primary research, secondary research, uh, the objectives, gaps in methodology. Uh, of course, making sure that we follow all the plagiarism standards, uh, uh, which are the best practices around the world. So the biggest, best part about this project or this experiential learning is that, uh, you know, of course, they'll be more analytical because they are going to be uh, researchers uh, and they will bring that to their world, to their jobs. Of course, they will get better jobs. There's, that doesn't go. What was great to see is that last year during the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, they actually managed to get 64 research papers published, right? Which is incredible. Uh, we've never had that in our history. And this year, which is continuing in the pandemic, uh, they have published 77 research papers, right? And four or five of them are in Scopus Index journals. So first we said we'll cultivate the, you know, research as a key component uh, in their learning, and then we'll take them up the quality stand. And we've started doing that. And last month we had an, uh, you know, there was an international research conference and 11 of our students presented along with uh, faculty from the US, along with faculty from Mexico, Zimbabwe, um, you know, Italy, Indonesia, you know, and of course, India. So uh, we were very happy to see our students really picking up this. And, and this was an experiment and it really went very well for us. So, I'm going to take a deep breath uh, and take a sip of water. And I would like you to hear some of the bits that our students have had through this progress. I hope you can hear. Hi, this is Priyanka Agarwal from Universal. I hope you can hear it. Yes, we can hear it. Okay, great. By inculcating the concept of business consulting into the academics, UBS strives to instill the employability skills into the students. Skills like strategic mindset, problem solving, commercial awareness, team management, communication, and self-management. This project actually gives an opportunity to apply all the classroom learnings in order to solve the business problems. My personal journey has been truly amazing because it was full of experiential and immersive learning. Thank you. Case Blazer is a once in a lifetime opportunity and I'm proud to have been a part of it during my experiential learning at UPS. Working day and night is a very strenuous and demanding task and it requires a lot of patience and agility which I learned during the competition. It also helped me enhance my critical thinking and teamwork abilities and provided a snapshot of how the management world works. The learnings have definitely made me a better individual. Hello everyone, I am Komal Jain from Universal Business School. After joining UBS, I have developed a keen interest in research work. I have research in the field of entrepreneurship, logistic industry and learning styles etc. I have designed questionnaires, took interviews and analyzed using various analytical tools like Excel and SPSS. It helped me in fostering critical thinking and analytical skills through hands-on learning. It has expanded my knowledge and understanding of various fields. It has improved my communication and interpersonal skills. As a management student, it is necessary to develop solutions for complicated business problems. And research work has given me a framework for efficient problem-solving skills. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to go to my last deep dive on the uh, SMART project. So this was a project uh, which we call SMART, which is Societal Causes Managerial Aptitude and Responsibility Temperament. We wanted our students to make a value. Uh, I know they're going to get great jobs and great careers, but what can they leave behind uh, as a staff? So here we have an intensive two-week program where students go into the villages, very rural, highly tribal villages of the state of Maharashtra where we are based. And they focus on education, health, livelihood, and environment, right? So it is all about, uh, you know, a guided immersion in year two that they 
what if they've learned in year one, they can actually go out and practice and create value in the real world. So, you know, it was challenging for them. Many of them, you know, it was an eye opener because many had never even stepped into a village, right? Here they were helping someone to create a jewelry product and take it to e-commerce where many of these people didn't even know how that entire world worked. So the focus was going after the bottom of the pyramid uh, like uh, S uh, Professor C.K. Prahlad uh, mentioned, right, uh, from Michigan. So we said, how can we make them sensitive to the society, de develop their character, and, you know, actually give them a solution which they will really value. Uh, so that was great. Uh, the experience was great. They developed all these skills like project management skills, uh, working under resource constraints, sensitivity to societal needs, which is, I think, very, very important. Uh, rural innovation, right? What innovation can you do at the bottom of the pyramid? Digital marketing skills, which were being uh, taught to, uh, you know, so they needed to get them uh, over and, and learn it themselves, right? So that was very, very uh, uh, an amazing experience for them when they actually went. And they were nervous. To be honest, they were very nervous. Uh, it opened up. And so at the end, how do we measure them? It's on the beneficiaries of each and every product, right? What have you done? What is the end use beneficiaries? A number of innovations you've brought to the table, the project timelines, have you executed on time? Uh, what is the final report which they submit to Universal Business School as well as uh, all our NGO partners? Uh, and, and that's where they start applying what they've learned and actually making an impact in society. So I'm, I'm pleased to share that you know 15,000 man hours uh, uh, were contributed uh, to this emotion. 50 plus villages were impacted and over a thousand beneficiaries from generating revenue to business inquiries to process improvements. And of course, new ideas in organic farming, water conservation, waste management and solar energy. So uh, very quickly, um, you know, I think you've got to understand the impact of all of these. Uh, you know, in the environment side, we looked at uh, an eco stove created by University of Berkeley, um, uh, in sorry, University of California, Berkeley, UC Berkeley. You know, how can we look at uh, community integration? How can we look at planting newer crops, ro crop rotation, uh, problems regarding, uh, you know, um, uh, plants, what, you know, pesticides, uh, fertilizers. And so it was all about creating that community and reducing water usage was the impact on the environment side. Uh, on the health side, we were very, very, uh, you know, privileged to have played our uh, part, our students played a part. So 520 uh, people affected with tuberculosis were, you know, impacted with all the health guidelines. Uh, we also from, you know, dental hygiene uh, to uh, hand wash, uh, this was, you know, 400 plus uh, people were covered in this. We covered 12 villages uh, and uh, several activities were done, uh, you know, to energize this, this rural population. Um, we made role plays. So uh, role plays were done by our students on child marriage, drug addiction, impor importance of education, because this is highly rural area. So, you know, and 700 people got eye screened because many of them didn't even know the concept of that, you know, we can't see, but we don't know why. Right? So that's where uh, you, you really see the impact. On the education front, we covered 15 villages, 200 men, beneficiaries were mobilized. Uh, and you know we, we worked with parents in terms of training them, getting a positive response and encouraging them to send their uh, children to, uh, to the schools. Right, And we painted the schools. We made the schools more interesting. Uh, we, uh, you know, there was a fundraising program where they actually donated a lot of things, including television sets, um, you know, uh, which this, you know, these schools have never ever seen something like that. And we coined the campaign, Badega Likhega India, to Abhi to Badega India. What that means is if India reads, writes, and learns, then only will it move forward, right? So we coined this and, and that really did the magic. Um, then on the livelihood front, uh, we, we created small businesses, whether it was, you know, making Cloth bags, 15,000 uh, cloth, cloth bags were sold. Uh, 2,800 paper bags were sold. Uh, we created a product of jewelry, took it to local markets in a, in a, uh, through e-commerce. Uh, 10 street plays were devised 
Uh, and, and so this was where you see, uh, you know, uh, you get a flavor of what was actually implemented. These are some glimpses. Uh, we also created manure, uh, you know, waste was converted into manure and then given. Uh, uh, these are some of the crops which never were there in this region and we were there. Students, uh, you know, were giving out certificates to uh, children to mo motivate them to come to school. Um, so it was a great, great overall uh, experience. Now this was in the physical world, right? What do you do when you have COVID? No problem. We had uh, inactives come to our, uh, you know, help us. And so being an inactive partner, we actually got uh, three projects uh, where we were, uh, you know, impacting various societies, uh, sorry, so, uh, social uh, stratas. And I'm going to not talk through it. I'm going to just share a video uh, and then we'll have time for maybe a few questions. So. Um, Hello everyone, this is Mahak Shah and last year I have joined Prajikia with the aim to provide inexpensive sanitary pads to rural areas. By engaging with NGOs generating leads and coordinating campaigns, I have enhanced my leadership skills. But above all, I have learned about how to use creativity to effect change in society. And being a girl, I feel connected to this project personally. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anis Roshan. I joined Project Kia with the aim to encourage good menstrual hygiene and create employment opportunities for women in rural India. I can confidently say that I have learned a lot about what is good menstrual hygiene. I have learned how to talk to NGOs and convert them. This has helped me in improving my communication skills. I gained knowledge about team building, management, achieving targets and how efficiently and effectively we can bring good to the society. Thank you. Hi, I am Ritvika and I am going to tell you about my journey in Project Panha. Being a part of this project has been a life-changing experience for me. I learned more about the weaker sections of the society, especially the women and the problems faced by them due to the pandemic. As a team, we were able to bring smiles to their faces and now I can definitely say that I am a better human, a better team player and a hopeful future entrepreneur. Hi, I am Varun. I am very grateful to be a part of Project Pana. Through this project, I got an opportunity to learn and experience many new things such as product marketing and how to maintain different customer relationships and most important which is teamwork. Being a part of this project, we tried to bring a change in the society by generating women employment and I am very proud to say that I was a part of this change during this pandemic. Thank you. Hi, my name is Juhi and I was a part of Project Group while my journey in an actress UBS. It has taught me many things, but the best thing was it made me a better human and made me think about others and put them first. Also make this world a better place so that I can do my responsibility and it's time for yours. Thanks. Hello, I am Hedpur. I joined Project Group last year with the aim to encourage plastic recycling in the society. I have no doubt in saying that I have learned a lot and gained knowledge about waste management, plastic industry, how to market your product, teamwork, and how to bring change in society through innovation. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sudarma Kamameto, President of Enactus UPS. We believe in creating opportunities, empowering women, and efficiently achieve sustainable goals. I am an enactor. Great. Uh, and so it's great to see that even when it's a complete lockdown, you can't go, you can still make a huge impact. This is my last slide. Uh, so how do we capture all of this, right? How do we capture this in a performance card, a progress card, which we call the MBA progress card? All the experiential learning has those credit points. So those are calculated based on the rubrics I said. And then we look at the skills, right? Whether it's leadership, teamwork, analytical, critical, all the things I talked about. We actually, uh, the mentor would be writing, um, you know, how he's seen the student progress uh, on the skill set uh, from when they started uh, to where they are today, right? So we track everything so that there is uh, transparency uh, and this can be uh, also like a, a feedback loop for us so that when we know what's going right, why, why we are not able to move the needle in terms of, uh, you know, improving those skills, that specific skill set in that specific uh, individual, and that helps us to recalibrate, go back, 
try and try new things, try new projects, give them different experiences. So uh, with that, I'll end with my last slide. Uh, uh, being challenged is in life is inevitable. Being def defeated is optional. Uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Now I leave it open for any questions. Uh, so I haven't looked at any of the uh, chats, but uh, I, Emma, if you can throw a few at me, then I'd love to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. We have a couple minutes. Thank you, Tarun, for this wonderful presentation. And for those of you asking, yes, the recording and the slides will be shared um, following the conclusion of the presentation. So we have a question um, asking about what are the biggest challenges that you have faced in maintaining such a comprehensive set of experiences? Um, excellent question. So um, the pandemic was huge. That really disrupted everything we were doing. Um, so what we did was the Case Blazer, which is a 48 hour intense, you know, on campus experience. We did a mini Case Blazer online. Uh, we tried to evolve it. I have to say it wasn't perfect. It was, I would say, 65% of what we would tend to get. But what actually helped us is we pulled the plug a little earlier. We were you know, proactive in that sense, got our students back for three and a half months on our campus. And so while we did that, we had an opportunity. And in that three and a half month period in the entire year, uh, we literally focused on all of this. So the trading room, uh, the case blazer was done, the consulting project was, you know, done. some of it very, very fast. Uh, you know, not uh, students were too pressurized. They like, you're just ramming it in. We said, you know, th we've got this window of opportunity. Don't know when the second wave will come. And it is here right now and very ugly. So we were really uh, fortunate to get it, but we did it fast. Um, uh, so that's one thing. I think the other thing is breaking the mindset. You know, uh, you know, for example, going for the smart project into the rural areas, you know, some of the students come from affluent backgrounds and they, they, they just don't know. They are out of sorts. They're like, we don't even know how a inside of a village looks like. So there is a, there is a you know, like a aha moment for them. And uh, uh, some obviously just say that, no, this is not, I'm not cut out to see such levels of uh, poverty or deprivation. Uh, so I think those are some of those adjustments which need to be made um, over time. I think the third area is always funding. Uh, we, uh, you know, always are uh, wanting to do more um, and we keep pushing our donors to give us some funds. So uh, the students have evolved over time and got, you know, got out there to get the funds. So I think that's the mental uh, method of doing it. And the final one for the a consulting project is, of course, skepticism on the part of the, um, you know, promoters of these small medium enterprises. Oh, what are you kids, right? How are you going to help us, right? So it starts that way. Uh, but I, we say, you know what, the amount of commitment is so small that even if we do a not so good a job, you will still get some value. And that's how we break the barrier. So do you have, apart from what you just shared, do you have any other tips or tricks or suggestions that you can provide for developing and maintaining those company relationships that support programs like this? Yeah, I think what we need to do ourselves also is to create a community, right? We are we right now uh, loving the experience that students get and we are transactional, right? We're going in, coming out. We would like to create an ecosystem with these, you know, uh, 100 odd small, medium enterprises and then bring them into our campus as well so that they can share some of the uh, you know, uh, feedback of the consulting. Was it really valuable, right? Where do we need to? So I think that part we need to fix um, over time. So that would be my tip for anybody moving down, you need to close the loop. Uh, so right now we are on the path of doing the work, getting the small token and the student learning side, that's where the focus is. I think on that real impact, you know, we would love to have a statistic which says the company grew by X to Y based on, you know, uh, the transformational work, but still sometimes before that happens. So what size of cohort of students typically participate in the program? So it's everybody, right? So we get, um, you know, 200 uh, students, uh, 240 students, every one of them go through. This is like their, uh, you know, uh, what we call the um, mark sheet, right? So all the, the while they have 
learning finance, marketing, operations, logistics, supply chains, organizational behavior, they have this. So each and every one has to go through. So we have a question and maybe I misunderstood, but they're wondering what are some of the challenges the students face in going out to find their own consultancy opportunities? So are the students finding their own opportunities or is this, so they are? Yeah, so we say, you know what? If you can't sell yourself for this small an amount, how are you wanting that big, uh, you know, salary, right? Which you all dream about. Uh, if you can't even, are you, so you can't show this much value. So yes, they have challenges, of course, uh, because our students come from 25 states and typically uh, different languages, right? So they come from, India has gazillion languages. So they're not even familiar with, uh, and some of these small medium enterprises probably don't even speak the high uh, English that you would uh, appreciate. So they, they face that challenge, um, you know, getting in. Some of them have never done this. So it's like doing a sale, right? It's a sales job to get a project. Um, so that's a huge challenge for many, but they have to break the mindset. So what we tend to do is we, you know, these groups are diverse. They are multi-discipline, uh, they are multicultural. Uh, and uh, what we try and do is, uh, you know, put them uh, from, um, you know, one sales guy is there in each so that he can take the brunt of it. But sometimes we don't get it, right? And sometimes they come crying and saying, you know, we don't have a project. So then we say, okay, uh, you know, go through your network. Right. I'm sure you have a friend whose father runs a business or something, you know, push your network out there and then they come back with something. Wonderful. So I early in your presentation, you spoke about um, building a pro program that the students have expressed to you that they want to have. So we have a question about where the findings from your student opinions come from. Uh, so we have a program rev level uh, meetings with our students. So students are part of the, uh, you know, program committee. Uh, they actually keep giving us a lot of feedback and we try and, you know, uh, put it in action. Um, and we'd like to do more of that. Uh, you know, there's just, there's sometimes so outlandish, uh, which is great. We love it. Um, you know, uh, suggestions. So they, that comes in through every, uh, we have, a, 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 you know, every term. They sit down, they uh, do it, we capture it, uh, and we also send it to all our partners. Wonderful. Well, I think, Tarun, I think we've gotten through all the questions that have been asked throughout. Oh, it looks like, wait, we have one more that's coming in. How do you mitigate the problem of people not taking your students seriously? Yeah, so as I said, um, it's a very small, uh, you know, we, we ask for as little as $100, right? So we're saying, you know, it's a meal. You're letting go of a meal. Now there are students who, uh, sorry, companies who will say, wow, uh, you know, here's a thousand dollars. Here's a five thousand dollars, right? We've done international projects of uh, ten thousand dollars as well. So that's great. But we're saying, you know, just get a hundred dollars. If you can't get a hundred dollars, then you, you can't get those, you know, six figure salaries. Right. So lower Wonderful. the threshold, lower the risk and, uh, you know, so some projects don't work out, right? Sometimes these uh, consulting projects aren't not hitting the spot. I, I'll be honest, not 100% will be effective to the day. Okay? So that creates some level of resistance for them to do it. That's part of the process. You're never gonna get 100% right. Of course, it's always a learning experience. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you for all of our attendees who joined us. As I said before, we will be sharing the recording and the slides from this presentation. Thank you so much, Tarun, and we hope to see you all at our next cross-border webinar. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.